All right, let's talk about some tactical tools. So, on the top, we're over on page 10 now. Anybody know who Viktor Frankl was? He's a doctor, psychologist, but most notably he was Holocaust survivor. And so he said, between stimulus and response, now his perspective by and large when he wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning, and when he made this quote, his perspective was that, was that of being a prisoner in a concentration camp. See, the whole book, Man's Search for Meaning, is all about how he framed that experience and then how he did behaviors not only to get himself through it, but to help get other people through it. Between stimulus and response, believe it or not, there is a space. And in that space lies the ability to choose your response. And in that choice lies your growth and your freedom. Here's the problem when you're in the midst of irrational fight or flight. It doesn't feel like you have a choice. Because when somebody presses your hot button, what do you immediately do? So what you need to train yourself to do is to create space. This is kind of an ironic slide, isn't it? You need to teach yourself, you need to train your subconscious brain to create space with a, some of you have already said it, with a what? With a breath. With a breath. Before you say that thing, before you do that thing on I-5. Do you guys sense that I have a little bit of an issue with I-5? <laughs> Particular, yeah, right? It doesn't need to be. Yeah, what they did on Mount Sexton, they, they, they need to do. And then those trucks need to stay in the right lane. And then those Washington drivers, what about those guys? I've got a lot of stuff to work on, don't I? Got a lot of stuff to work on. You need to create the space. Here's the problem. If you're experiencing irrational fight or flight, it's not enough to consciously think, I need to get a breath. Because guess what's not available to you when you're in the midst of fight or flight? Your conscious brain. Now that's ironic. Would you agree with me though consciously that before you do the next thing, you might want to think about it for a half a second, that is, put the conscious brain back in control. Can we at least agree on that? So what we then need to do is to train our subconscious brain when we're experiencing irrational fight or flight, that is, when a grizzly's not chasing us up the mountainside, when we're not being chased by a cheetah across the Sahara, sub Saharan whatever that is that cheetahs chase you across in Africa, when your life is not, the Sub-Saharan what? Savannah. When our life is not literally in danger, we need to get out of the midst of it, would you agree? So here's the first big thing you can do. We're gonna have a way of simulating fight or flight. We're all gonna do this. <gasps> when I say, one, two, three. <gasps> okay, so ready? One, two, three. <gasps> That's you simulating fight or flight. Then what's the very next thing you wanna do? Now I can read minds. Did you guys know I can read minds? I can just imagine what you're thinking right now. I'm being confronted by this manager that's calling my presentation stupid. <laughs> And I say, hold up a bit. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. Are there different ways of getting that breath in? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going to teach you pacing, backtracking, and clarifying. A set of conflict management tools in which when you determine that you need to get your head back on your shoulders when your subconscious mind is saying, I need that breath, you're going to be figure out a way to get it. So let's simulate right now. Ready? One, two, three. <gasps> Take a breath. One, two, three. <gasps> Take a breath. See, that's the number one thing you can practice. You practice that once per day. You know what you're going to find yourself doing out on I-5 when someone cuts you off, when someone's being rude? You're going to be going, what's the next thing I want to do? Slam on my brakes. No, just kidding. No, we're not going to do that. Does that make sense to you guys? And so then you can plan the way you're going to respond. You can get the clear head back on your shoulders so you can at least think for the next two or three seconds, what am I going to do? Does that make sense? Ready? One, two, three. <gasps> Take a breath. Between stimulus and response, believe it or not, there is a space. And in that space lies your ability to choose your response. And in that choice, Viktor Frankl, watching thousands of Jews go to the ovens every day, Viktor Frankl said that. Can you guys do it? Ready? One, two, three. <gasps> Take a breath. Okay, video.
not like that. Now, uh, what I didn't tell you, the background of that video is that guy, over the weekend, what they did is they uninstalled Windows 7 and they installed Windows 8. <laughs> and that's why he got so mad. Yeah, no, he was just dealing with it. And he had a meeting in five minutes. Could he have had a better response? Do you think that was a hot button for him? Yeah, it was. Okay. Now, Mary's going to come up and talk to you about active listening. Thanks, Rob. Um, Rob Brad about a really interesting point. How many of you have had that experience where you're working on something, you got a meeting in five minutes, you're going along and you're typing and you're doing it, and that person, you see them coming, they're walking right towards you and they say, hey, how's it going? And you keep typing and you're pretending, uh-huh, I'm listening, I'm listening. What's the message you're sending to that person? Go away, you're not important, I don't have time, oh my gosh. The look on your face sometimes screams what you'd like to do to them. Um, you know, choke them. Uh, active listening requires, it does not mean that you're going to immediately drop everything that you're doing and give that person your ultimate 100% attention right now. What it does mean is that you're going to need to prioritize. You can't just ignore that person. I think being honest with them, I've got a meeting in five minutes, I, can we reschedule this? Would that be a better response yeah. than faking it? How many of you have faked it and actually typed the words that that person said <laughs> and then messed up your email too? How's that for time management? Active listening requires that you listen. And the very first little step there, or the very first tip we'd like to give you is this. Decide to listen and concentrate. We all have the ability. Stop the email and say, just a moment, let me finish my thought on here, and then the time is all yours. Prioritize listening or prioritize what you're doing. You can't do both. Rob talked about empathize. Empathize with the speaker. Be Billy, able to put it into their space, or yourself into their space. Empathy requires you understanding what's going on for them. Putting it through the, the filter of their personalities, that is one of the filters that we filter things through. Now, we have a huge, uh, we have a program that we uh, filmed here uh, at Tap Rock called Colorful Connections. I've got a copy of it on the back table. You'll have an opportunity to win one in the seminar today, if you'll put your name in the thing. But we've given you a reference card. Um, if you'll take a look at this reference card very quickly, I'll, we don't have time, of course, to go through the whole thing because it's a full seminar. If you'll look at the branching chart, this quickly shows you an opportunity to read someone in the moment, in their personality. Are they engaging or are they reserved? If they're engaging, are they a driven form of engagement or are they a cheerful form of engagement? If they're reserved, are they cool or are they warm? And then all you do is flip it over and apply the communication do's and don'ts that we have here for you. Very handy little reference guide. Um, but uh, put yourself in their shoes. Empathize with them through the filter of the personalities. Also for what's happening with them. Now you were mentioning, you know, what was going on with you. I mean, in, 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 in your day-to-day -day life can cause major changes in how, in how soon you need something, how well you're focused. What are some other things that can happen in your life that can cause you to maybe not communicate as well? What's happening at home? What's happening at home. It definitely can affect that, right? So try to empathize as best you can. Put yourself in their shoes. Watch body language and tone. Theirs and yours. Men and women have different body languages, and in one of our other seminars, we talk a lot about the differences between men and women in body language. But can tone be misunderstood? Yes. Can you sound different when you're in a hurry? When you're empathizing with that person, being able to, to we're going to talk about pacing, backtracking, and clarifying. Part of the clarification is, is reading that tone and saying, I'm picking up, you know, the urgency. Um, listen without interruption. This is so hard. I can, I can empathize with you on that. It is. It's really difficult, especially for some personality styles, to, to not do that. 
Then there's those personality styles that will interrupt you to correct your, your grammar or, or, or correct you in the moment. When somebody's in a, in a conversation, it's not time to start correcting them or you won't get the actual communication. Do we do that more with people we know or people we don't know? Yeah, we, we, you know, we're, we're typing along and we see them coming and we think, oh, I know where she's going with this. I can tell by the way that she's walking. I know what she's going to say. I think we pay more attention to strangers than we do the people that we spend a lot of time with because we don't know what they're going to say, so we don't jump to conclusions. We also have uh, pacing, backtracking, and clarifying. And to talk about pacing, backtracking, and clarifying, I'm going to bring Rob back up here. He does an excellent job of explaining how to pace someone, how to backtrack, and how to clarify. A round of applause for Mary. We are going to take a break here. I'm going to ba basically just introduce the concept of pacing, backtracking, clarifying, but I want to give you a couple of article references that can help you out with active listening in general. So before I give you the just basic intro to pacing, backtracking, clarifying, please write down these two articles somewhere on this page. Uh, the first article is Leadership That Gets Results. Leadership That Gets Results. That was initially published uh, in the Harvard Business Review in April of 2004, written by Daniel Goleman, who wrote the book, did the research on emotional intelligence. It's a very nice primer on emotional intelligence and positions these communication, listening skills, empathy skills within the context of that. And the article then, after building a nice foundation about emotional intelligence, this is only about a 12-page article, then goes on to do a very nice job explaining situational or adaptive leadership which is how you can flex your style from a leadership perspective with different kinds of people. Uh, you can go out and Google that article. It'll pop right to the top of the list as a PDF that you can download, print, share with other people. All right, second article I want you to write down is The Siren, that's S-I-R-E-N, The Siren Song of Multitasking. When you're actively listening to someone, should you be actively listening with your conscious brain or your subconscious brain? Okay, good. I hear both. And I think a lot of people would say that multitasking is part of your job description. How many of you all would agree with that? Please write this down. Write this down. The conscious brain cannot multitask. The conscious brain cannot multitask. So it's just not going to be me saying that. You're going to go read this article by Herman Miller, The Siren Song of Multitasking, that's going to give you the studies and the empirical information behind that. And it's the conscious brain that should be actively listening. So when someone walks into your office, you need to give them the time and the space and the engagement with your conscious brain and put your task to the side. Or tell them to come back later and continue to work on your task. Because guess what? You can't do both. The conscious brain, A, can multitask, or B, can't multitask? The conscious brain cannot multitask. Interesting, what uh, this article does actually goes through seven different studies that they did on multitasking, empirical studies. One particular study found that trying to multitask with your conscious brain actually reduces your ability to pull things through your conscious brain and put it into short-term memory. It actually damages you neurologically. Did I say you couldn't multitask? No. Can you multitask? What kind of stuff can you multitask? Your habit type stuff. Can you drive down the road? And this is a big debate about texting and being on the phone, by the way, is how much of driving can be done with the subconscious mind and how much can be done with... Actually, probably 90 95% can be done with the subconscious mind. But you never know when you're going to need that 5% conscious engagement. That's the reason it needs to always be there, right? In the article, they do a very good job of parsing this issue, which means when people look like they're multitasking consciously, they're not multitasking consciously. What they are is task switching very, very quickly. Focused attention, focused attention, focused attention. And what Mary just explained is that women, to your point and her point, are much better at doing that. Task sw switching, conscious task switching. That's just because our corpus callosum is bigger. Oh, there you exactly. go. That's because, women, your corpus callosums are bigger. <laughs> Everybody knows the corpus callosum connects the right part of your brain with the left part of your brain and allows you to go back and forth neurologically. That was beautiful. I bow to your, I bow to your brain science knowledge. All right, so just a quick introduction to pacing, backtracking, clarifying, then we go on for a break. So pacing is mirroring. Have you heard of this? 
mirroring, <laughs> matching the energy at various levels of the person. We'll talk about that. Backtracking is when you hear them say something, at least using part of the exact language you just heard. Clarifying is putting it in your own words and making sure that you understand it. All right, so here's the plan. We're going to go over the next couple of pages in your workbook, starting with that pa uh, page. I'm going to say a bit more about pacing, backtracking, clarifying. What is that, page 11? So everybody get page 11. And then we'll build that in to what we call a four-step process of dealing with conflict. And then once we're done with that, we're going to put you into an activity. Does that sound fun? You're going to use these skills in the real world to see how much you're able to hold on to. So pacing. How many of you all have ever heard the term pacing? What does pacing mean to you? Dawn. Matching or mirroring. Some of you, if you've done classic sales training, may have heard that term. Matching the energy, matching the words, matching the body language. What's the purpose? Why are we doing that? Build to build rapport. We want to build a relationship, make the, make the conversation comfortable. Do you want to do this in every single interaction? No, you want to do it in the interactions where you're trying to build a foundation for having an open, honest discussion and moving forward, right? So there's three things you can match or mirror. Words, tone, and body language. Now Mary mentioned this in terms of active listening, but there was a guy by the name of Albert Morabian that did a study, UCLA in the 70s, where he studied when people are under stress or when people don't feel like they can be honest. You have to contextualize with that. You can actually get more of the message from what? Body language and tone. So when you're matching someone, Yes, match the words, match the vocabulary, try to use a vocabulary that makes sense to them, you know, that makes sense to you, we're using kind of the same words. But really, if I'm trying to connect with you and you're giving me more like indirect body language, like folded arms, stuff like that, what should I do if I'm pacing? Put your hands down. I should do the same thing. Should I be like a total mirror? Should I like get a chair and sit right across from you and like do the very same thing you do? You're matching the energy level of the body language. Tone, same kind of thing. If you learn how to do that, you can build rapport with a person and get more effectively connected within the conversation. That's pacing. Any questions about pacing? You wouldn't want to do this when they're angry. <laughs> wouldn't you want to come off as the calm one? Okay, so the comment on the front is, I wouldn't want to do this when they're angry. Well, actually, it's kind of interesting because that's our exact example. Oh, is it? All right. Have you guys ever heard of the word assertive versus aggressive? When someone's being aggressive with you, do you want to back down and tell them to calm down and, 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 and basically pace being calm, cool, collected yourself? No. What do you want to do? Do you want to be aggressive? No. You want to be aggressive right back? You want to be assertive. What's the difference? Right, you're still right there, you're engaged, you're listening to what their issue is, but you're not crossing the line and getting right back in their face. You can make that mistake. So when they're angry, you want to pace the intensity of the message, but you know, it's not the anger embedded in the message. Does that make sense? All right, any other questions? That's good. Any, give her a big round of applause, that was awesome. Okay, yes. So I think that I heard you say that if someone's sitting like this and, and kind of introverted kind of thing, that you want to mirror that? Yeah. If you're trying to bring it out, though, wouldn't you want to be Yeah, more so you might want them to open. eventually open up and talk more. But the last thing you're going to want to do is try to fun them up. Well, this is a classic mistake I've made. Hey, you know, what's wrong? Something wrong? Something going on? Hey, this is funny. Look at me. Look at me now. Eventually, you might want to get to that spot. But to initially to make the conversation comfortable with them, same level, same degree of closed body language or same degree of eye contact. That's the rationale. So pace for rapport first, and then try to lead them to another place later. That's the idea. Does that make sense to you guys? OK, yes? Matching the speed that they speak. There it is. All of that. Speed, intentional, vocabulary, body language, tone. Try as best you can to match it. That's pacing to build rapport. Next thing you can do if somebody's really intent and they're angry is you backtrack. The idea behind backtracking to some degree, and you do with certain personality styles, need to be careful with this one. This is what I heard you say. This is, these are the words that I heard, okay? Did I get it right? If you do that skillfully, people are going to feel heard. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. But use it unskillfully, it may backfire. My guy in my meeting that I told you about. 
the beginning. So I guess what you hear, I hear you saying is that's the stupidest plan you've ever seen. You need to be a little careful. But if you use the words that they use, they feel heard most of the time. There's some skill there. And then the third step is to put it in your own words. That's clarifying. Okay, this is what I understand you to mean. This is what I understand that that means. Ultimately, we'll get there. But had I used this skillfully in that interaction, had I had these skills fully developed, I would have gone through the clarification process and ultimately found out that he'd already expressed that my timeline was too aggressive and that there were certain suppliers that this particular project wasn't going to work with. Had I been able to get a cool head on my shoulders, backtracked and then clarified the message, I could have done that in about five seconds instead of taking about three years off my life for the next two years, or the next two weeks, thinking and replaying this thing over and over. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. These are real skills that add real minutes, hours, days, weeks, and years to your life if you learn how to use them skillfully and will impact the lives of anybody else you can influence. Flip on over to the next page. So what we like to say is when you're dealing with somebody that's amped up, angry, there are four steps to manage conflict. Step one, let them vent. Write that down. Let them vent. Listen. Let them vent. This is where active listen comes in. Okay, now here's what's happening. Have you ever heard that if you interrupt people while they're venting, what, what's the problem with that? See, they feel like there's some stuff they need to get off their chest. As long as they're not attacking you, as long as they're not saying rude words and calling you names and stuff like that, you should just let them go because the air is coming out of the balloon they feel like they need to climb Mount Anger <coughs> and whenever you knock them back down to the base of Mount Anger guess what they're gonna start to do right over again as they approach the summit of Mount Anger you're gonna start to hear more coherence in their voice more meaningful words and you're gonna be able to start grabbing onto them so you're gonna go to step two which is work to understand that's where you use pacing backtracking and clarifying When you say my plan is stupid, what I'm hearing is that there's some aspects of what I proposed here that aren't going to work. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I called your plan stupid, Rob, because I passed you in the hallway last week and I mentioned the timeline's too aggressive and this is not going to work with the memory suppliers. You know what? I don't remember that conversation, but I'll tell you what. What I understand now is I need to pull the memory suppliers out and back the timeline off by, what, four or six weeks? Cool. Yeah, got it. Is that better? And sitting like, 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 a, like a little baby at my desk, driving to and from work, just kind of brewing in the stew of this. Is that better? Right? I owned most of that, you guys, because I didn't have the skills. Step three, work to a solution. If you're going to work to a solution with someone going back and forth and saying this is what you're going to do, then step four, you better go ahead and do it. Follow through. Have you ever noticed people who, who, who signed up to do anything you wanted them to do? Let's just get this thing over. They promise to be a hero just to get the interaction over, and then what happens at the end? Dude, you're saying you're going to do all this. I know you're not going to do it. And then, have you ever had to go that side road? If you're going to commit to something, you want to be able to follow through. Does that make sense? Does it? Yes. Any questions you want to ask me? Because we're going to do it. Go for it. Okay. So as we're working through our solutions, one of the tools that I have always found is a water pitcher. No. Is this. Instead of saying, this is what I think we ought to do, try this as you're backtracking and clarifying. Let's say the problem that we're dealing with is this water pitcher or the idea that we're kicking around is this pitcher of water. If that person is looking at it from this perspective, what do they see that you can't see? The handle. The handle. And they're going to spend all their time talking about the handle, and this is how you're looking at it. What can you see? The spout. And so you're going to be spending all your time talking about the spout. 
The reason why Stephen Covey talks about seek first to understand and then to be understood is because this is the step to co conflict resolution is this. Coming to their side of the table and saying, oh, I see how you're seeing the situation. This is how I see the situation. What do you think we ought to do about it? You've now moved it from confrontation into conversation. So you might want to write that down. I see what you're saying. This is how I see the situation. What do you think we ought to do about it? Pitch your water. Okay. Are you ready? A. B. 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 A. I want you three right here to work as a group. A's stay with me, B's go with Mary. Out into the lobby. All right, you guys ready for this? You need to be able to stay in character. The character I'm about to give you, it's only gonna take a couple minutes, all right? You willing to do this? Okay, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the, your top sales performer, you guys are sales managers. You're all individual sales managers, okay? Your top sales performer in the last few weeks has been distant, in a bad mood, and not performing, not getting anything done, not making sales calls. Things are starting to go south in terms of his interaction with the other team, all that kind of stuff. You don't know what's going on. Uh, reports are late. Sales calls have dropped off, and other members of the sales team are expressing concerns. What you've done is you've called a meeting uh, with this person in a one-on-one -on -one session to try to figure out what's going on. Now what I want you to do is when they come in and sit down, we're gonna not start everything until I say on your mark, get set, go. At which time, since you called the meeting, that would be the appropriate time to say thank you for coming in for the meeting and then start to talk. What I want you to attempt to do is use the tools of pacing, backtracking, and clarifying. Any questions at all? Yes, sir. You cannot fire them. Okay, so, so good. So that's a very good question. All right. I don't want you to try to work to a solution. All I really want you to do is use pace, backtrack, and clarifying just to understand what's going on. All right. And then oftentimes do people try to solve a problem that they don't completely understand? They try to jump to a solution because you want the problem to go away. Right? So all I want you to do is try to use pacing, backtrack, and clarifying to, to, to find out what's going on. So here's the situation. You are going to be the quiet ones. You are going to be the upset ones. Here's the scenario. Several weeks ago, one of your coworkers pulled you aside and mentioned that you better watch your back. This person made some general references to the sales manager. That would be the person in there. Reference to the sales manager. Not being happy with your sales technique and having major concerns. This problem is, um, the problem is, this is the first time you've heard it. It's kind of a rumor. You've been angry ever since. You've been, you know, stewing inside, talking to your coworkers about it. Uh, but you haven't talked to the boss yet because you don't know really what to say. Your attitude's been kind of slipping, kind of getting a little bit of an attitude issue. So there, your sales manager has called you in for a one-on-one. -on -one. Kind of find out why your attitude is starting to happen. So my quiet group over here, when Rob says go, here's going to be your response in this one-on-one. -on -one. You are going to not say a word. You're going to close up. You're going to sit there with your arms folded, maybe even mumble a little bit of unprofessional, unfair attitudes. If the, now, the boss is going, to suppose, is going to be using pacing, backtracking, and clarifying in order to open up and find out what the problem is because they have no idea that you heard this rumor. They have no idea what's going on. All of a sudden, you've, you've gone from the top performer down to this problem, and they want to find out what's really going on for you. Now, if they start pacing and backtracking with the right body language, then you're to open up slowly to them. 
You guys over here, you're the angry responders. You know how to be angry? Okay, so when the meeting starts, you're going to smack the table. You're going to ramble on on how uncomprehensible you are and how loyal you've been and how you don't understand why you're being attacked and things are being said about you because you've given the company everything. Now, as they pace and backtrack you and your anger, then you'll start calming down. If they don't, stay amped up. If they don't, stay closed down. This is their pacing backtracking exercise. Does anybody have any questions for me? Could you repeat what the rumor was? We have no idea what the rumor okay. was. It was that the, 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 um, one of your coworkers came and said they heard that you better watch your back. Oh, that's it. We and don't, I'm yeah. Saying. Not being happy with your sales technique and having major concerns over your performance. Oh, okay. But you don't know for sure. Now go ahead and, um, and make sure you find a partner. You gotta find a partner. Find an A. Okay, you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Okay, now, first of all, let me just ask the group, how many of you all were able to figure out how many A's, where are my A's, raise your hands, how many A's, how many of you all were able to figure out what the issue with the salesperson was? Okay, what was it? One, I felt very unfairly treated and just being criticized with no way forward to make changes so she could improve. Okay. Okay, anybody else get a different spin, different words on it? Yes? That they gave their life to the company and they had no recognition. Okay, wow. Was that in either setup? No. Isn't it amazing what things can turn into? All right. Some of you got it, some of you didn't. Bs, what were you coached to do? Talk. And then if what happened, get more clarity with your message. If Pacing, backtracking, clarifying. If they were trying to do that, yep. then go ahead and let it come out more and more details about that. How many of you all, based on what you just heard and what you experienced, feel pretty successful with that? How many of you all think there could be improvement? Yes. <laughs> and what's the biggest thing that you think could be improved? How many of you all, when that first started, and maybe you were trying to figure out what the issue was or trying to figure out how to move forward, how many of you A's in particular were feeling a little stressed? What are you supposed to do when you're having the stress reaction? Breathe. How many of y'all remembered to get a breath? A couple of you. That's actually good. That's actually good. Do you think pacing, backtracking, and clarifying works in the real world? Yes. But all of these skills, the skills that we've talked about so far, the skills of using the personal management system, which we're about to go through, all rely on you when you're experiencing a rational fight or flight, all on rely on what? You've got to breathe. You've got to get that conscious brain back in control so that you can plan and engage and be very overt about the next steps that you're taking. You guys did a great job with the activity. It was just meant to illustrate the tools that you've got to practice with, allow the learning curve, and use in the real world if you're going to really use them. And I know you guys are. Give your partners a high five, handshake, or hug.